Hi everyone, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with the video of the day. Now this game is a game that I played in 1992, and if you've watched all of my St. Louis videos, you've probably seen this game before. Now this game is very similar to a Jackie Chan movie, because there's a big attack, it's uh, really well played, um, it's exciting, and um, there's a, a brutal finish. So if you're a Jackie Chan fan, and I'm, I'm sure you are, then uh, you're going to like this game. And, um, well, the, maybe there's a slight difference. This game's a little more violent than a, than a, Jack, a Jackie Chan movie. Okay, so the first thing is first, I, I've already made a big mistake, but we can fix that by flipping the board. Hopefully Mike Cummer's not watching this video because he would have saw, he would have seen black was at the bottom and he would have been so confused. Okay, this game was played in 1992 against Russian Grandmaster Yuri Balashov. Uh, he was 100 points higher rated than me at the time. Um, and probably he was even higher rated, you know, 15, 20 years before this game. This was sort of uh, at the end of his career, I guess. Um, and this was in the last round. And I guess um, because I won the game, I think I tied maybe for fourth or fifth. And Capala Grande is actually a very strong tournament now. Usually has over 100 grandmasters. Um, it's near uh, Dunkirk in, in uh, France. It's a small uh, suburb. And um, w when I played in it, it was just starting out. I think it started in something like 1987 or 1988, and they've been holding it annually since. And it usually gets 400 or 500 players, of which at least 150 of them are IMs and GMs. So it's a nice tournament. Okay, and this was um, the last Capel that I played in. I, I lived in Belgium from 1988 to 1992. And so this tournament, I believe, was in February, and I moved away, uh, I think, in either June or July of 92. Okay, so this actually was probably my last tournament in France. All right, so um, I played white in the Queen C2 Nemzo Indian, which I, I quite often do. And uh, Balashov played an unusual line. Uh, probably the two most common moves here are castles and c5, although d5 is also very common. And occasionally I face knight c6 also. Okay, my opponent played d6. And the idea is black eventually is going to trade off his bishop for the knight, um, which they do in most Dimzo Indians. And so black's going to put his remaining pawns on dark squares um, now that his dark square bishop is gone. So this is a typical idea. Okay, I played bishop g5, and um, well, it wasn't super exciting. He played a little bit unusually by playing c5. Sometimes in these kind of structures, black plays for e5, but c5 is okay. And I decided that I wanted to play knight g to e2, and usually I play knight f3 in almost every queen pawn opening, but I was hoping to take back with the knight on, on c3. So I played bishop d3, I didn't want to play knight e2 first and block my bishop. Well, that's possible. And my opponent prevented knight e2 by playing queen a5, although I must say the queen's not really well placed on a5. And the idea is if I play knight e2 and he takes on d4, um, whether I take back with the pawn or the knight, I'm, I'm losing my bishop on g5. So I would have to take on f6, which I don't really want to give up the two bishops because... I'm going to win the two bishops by force once he takes my knight on c3 with his bishop. This idea with queen a5 attacking the bishop on g5 is commonly seen uh, in the Cambridge Springs variation of the queen's gambit declined. Okay, so I, I decided not to lose a piece. I played knight f3, which defends my bishop, so I'm not worried about c takes d4 anymore, which is what he played. I took with the pawn. And he played bishop c3 check. And when I'm giving private lessons, this is a position that I show most of my students. I ask them which way they would take back. And irrespective of whether white takes back with the queen or the pawn, uh, white's going to get this pawn structure with doubled and isolated pawns. So basically the question is, does white want to trade queens? Well, if you have a worse pawn structure and you have the two bishops and you have a leading development, you definitely don't want to trade queens. Because the two bishops in the lead in development means that you have chances for initiative. And if you have a bad pawn structure, you really don't want to play an endgame. So I took with a pawn. 
Okay, now this bishop on c8, we have a lot of problems with this bishop in lots of queen pawn openings. Uh, my students have problems, I have problems, you have problems. Um, well, you had problems that weren't really related to chess, but now they're chess problems. So this is, uh, this is an unusual situation. My opponent decided he was going to play b6 and either play bishop b7 or bishop a6, or in the case of the game, both. Of course, if you play b6, your queen on a5 is even more suspicious than usual. So my opponent retreated his queen with queen c7, and the idea is, uh, in this game and in many Nimzo Indians, the c4 pawn is potentially weak. Black could attempt to play bishop a6, rook c8, and he's got a lot of a lot of guys attacking my pawn on c4 there. So queen c7 makes sense, although black is losing some time. Okay, we both castled. And this is the, the hard part of chess. Um, I've castled to develop my pieces. Now what do I do? Well, it seemed obvious to me I should be attacking his king because I have a lot of pieces, you know, that are sort of near his king. And he has a lot of pieces that are not near his king. So time to attack his king. Now, I'd like to get my rooks involved and my pawns involved, and my knight on f3 really can't do anything of note. So I play the strategical move knight to d2. This does many things. It defends c4 again, so I'm less worried about my weak pawn. Uh, it unblocks my f pawn so I can advance, and my knight is ready to go to e4 in some cases, and it clears off the third rank, so I can do some kind of rover by moving my rook up and over. And so I have a lot of ideas with knight d2. In fact, I did another idea, which I didn't even discuss here. Okay, so he played h6 attacking my bishop. I moved my bishop away. And he played b6. And now I decided I wanted to play knight e4. But if he takes my knight, I don't want to take with a bishop. I'd rather take with the pawn and have a monster pawn center. So since this is 1992... I hadn't established all my quote-unquote crazy rules yet, so I played f3. And I want to play knight e4, which threatens f6. And if he takes my knight, I'll play f takes e and have this monster pawn center. And my rook on f1 will have an open file. So he tried to prevent knight e4 by playing bishop a6. And he's not attacking my pawn on c4 yet, but he's tying my pieces down to the, the pawn. So I played queen a4, attacking his bishop and defending my pawn. And when he saved his bishop, then I played knight e4. Okay, I don't think black wants me to take the knight and force his pawn structure to be compromised. He can't really move his knight off of f6. For example, if he plays knight h7, then I could play something like bishop e7, uh, which would, should win material. I guess he could play, well, if he plays knight e8, then this is the same as rook's trapped. He might have knight c5, um, well, they might not. So knight e8, knight h7 are pretty passive. My knight on e4 is pretty strong. So he took my knight, and I took with a pawn, and I have a nice pawn setter. Uh, and again, earlier in the game, I explained when black played d6, he was planning on trading off his bishop and putting all of his pawns on dark squares. Well, he didn't play e5 yet, so now he played e5. And unfortunately... My bishop on d3 isn't really participating in the attack because the pawn on e4 is blocked. And I don't want to play d5 gaining space because I give up the c5 square and my pawns are pretty weak on the queen side. Okay, now, one thing I tell my students is that they should have previous experience either by playing blitz chess or slow chess or doing tactics online or reading chess books. And one thing you can get experience with without losing any chess games is looking at other people's games, sometimes at tournaments, sometimes in books, sometimes in magazines, sometimes online. And when I was a little kid, I remember reading a lot of uh, games of Mikhail Tal and books that I had. And there was a game that Tal beat Botvinnik where he made this maneuver. So this maneuver wasn't hard to find because I had already seen it before although it would probably been 20 years. Okay, so I want to attack on the king's side, as I, as I noted, and my rook is on the open f file, my bishop's on the king's side, my other bishop is pointing towards the king's side, black has very few pieces near his king, but my queen on a4 is sort of silly. 
And this maneuver has been referred to by Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan as a, as a billiard shot. Because you can imagine a pool table and maybe this is the cue ball and you want to hit the cue ball over here somewhere, but there's a lot of other balls in the way. So on a, a billiards table, you would hit a bank shot. Okay. And so, well, in chess, you can't do that, but you can do it in two moves. So I play queen d1. And this idea of moving the queen from one side of the board to the other via d1, as I said earlier, I, I'd seen in a Mikhail Tall game. Okay, my opponent played rook a8. Since the rook on a8 was useless, then I played queen g4. My opponent didn't like my queen on g4, so he played bishop c8, threatening knight to c5. And I played queen h5. I think the bishop's worse on c8 than it was on b7, so I'm not too unhappy. And he played bishop a6. Wow, he found every square in the diagonal for his bishop. He's trying to win my c4 pawn. And I'm definitely not going to play queen e2 and defend my pawn. I, I didn't come here to defend my double pawn. I came here to mate my opponent. So I played rook f3. I want to double rooks on the f file. I want to play rook to g3. I want to attack his king. He took his pawn, and I played rook g3. Well, now the obvious threat is queen takes h6, and he didn't like that. Now, here he made a bad move, and probably after this move, he's losing. And if you've watched a lot of my lectures, then you probably know what it is already. It's a move I say never play. And obviously, he played it with the intention of defending later, but this move loses time and gives back the pawn. Um, played the move f6. And the idea is, when I take the pawn on h6, threatening mate, on g7, he can play rook f7. Um, okay, material is equal, but now my rook is overworked. Luckily, it's my move. My rook is defending my bishop, and my rook is pinning his pawn to the king. So if it was black's move, black would win immediately with the simple bishop takes d3, and I, I can't take back because my queen's hanging. Okay, so I save my bishop. And now, even though black is probably losing because I have a nice center, I have two bishops, I have an attack... Black's knight is pretty passive. He can't really make any threats. It's sort of a strategical losing. It's not the kind of losing that is going to take five or ten moves. It's going to take a whole game to prove. And here my opponent played a very bad move, which strategically would be recommended in a lot of books, but it doesn't work tactically. Um, you always read and hear when somebody's attacking on the wing, I'm attacking on the king's side, you should counterattack on the center. Well, as I said earlier in the video, my bishop, my white square bishop, which was on d3 and now is on c2, isn't really doing anything. It's blocked by the pawn, and my opponent hooked me up. He played the move d5, and I was like, oh boy, I take, and now my bishop's pretty good, okay? And the reason he did that was he wanted to play the tricky move e4, which blocks my bishop and contains sort of a hidden threat. Because my rook on g3 is pinning his g-pawn, which is the only reason why he can't take my queen, black is now threatening queen takes rook, which would win a rook, because then we trade queens, or we don't trade queens, and I still lose a rook. Well, my queen's been on h6 long enough, so queen h5, now my queen's not hanging anymore. And he was worried that his rook was undefended on the back rank, um, although I can't really take advantage of it. Uh, so he played a very passive move, which defends it. Not only does my queen on h5 put pressure on this diagonal, and it gets off the g-pawn, it also defends my d-pawn. So it's a really all-purpose move. Play queen c8, really passive move now that black is a pawn down and white is attacking. Okay, rook h3. I'm getting my queen and rook lined up on the h-file. Played knight f8, as recommended by Bent Larson, who once said, you never get mated with a knight on f8. Well, I guess he didn't see this game. Okay, now I play the move of the game I'm proudest of, the game which will put my listeners to sleep because it's so boring, but it's the kind of move that I like. Um, as you know, my favorite player is Paul Morphy, and Paul Morphy always used all of his pieces in the attack, so I'm sure he would make this move. Uh, it's basically the only piece White hasn't moved yet, the rook on A1, which is doing nothing. And any of my... Current wives or ex-wives will tell you I'm the master of doing nothing. But that doesn't mean my pieces should do nothing. So I play the move rook e1, which attacks the e4 pawn. And the problem is, 
if black plays something like f5, which defends his pawn, that really increases the scope of my bishop. And my bishop could go to g5, and I'd be threatening queen h8 mate, for example. And here, I remember, just like most of you at home remember, what you were doing during your game 25 years ago. I was walking around now looking at other games. And back then, we didn't really have, well, I don't want to say we didn't have electronic clocks, but they were rare. Most of the clocks were analog. And for those of you who are under the age of 25, go find an older person and ask them what an analog clock is. Okay, so the analog clocks, you, you could look at them from pretty far away and see if the plunger was up, the part that you hit. And as I was walking around the room, at some point I noticed my plunger was up, so it was my move. And I came back to the board, and I was shocked to find that my opponent played a move that I knew was impossible. And when I say impossible, it's not illegal like some of the moves you guys make. It's just a terrible move. And he played the move g6, attacking my queen. Uh, breaking a very important rule, don't move pawns in front of your king. And I guess he wanted to play f5 the next move and have a nice pawn structure. Um, and also he could go to h7 with his rook or his knight and block the h file. Unfortunately, he doesn't have time to do that because now I have a forced checkmate. So pause the video and try to find white's forced mate. Uh, and after my next move, my opponent resigned. Okay, uh, hopefully you've already seen this game or you figured it out quickly. The answer is queen h8 check. And you don't get to sacrifice your queen too often against a player that's higher rated, especially a Russian Grandmaster, in the last round of the tournament. And, of course, my opponent resigned if he takes the queen. I play bishop f6, double check. Checking with the rook and the bishop. He has to play king g8 and mate. So queen h8 was a nice way to finish the game. And um, it was nice to win in the last round and get some money. And, uh, well, I hope you enjoyed that game. I remember I was doing puzzles online once. I don't remember what website it was. I think it was ICC, but I, I could be wrong. And this position popped up, and it said white to move and mate in three. And I was like, oh, this is my game. So that was sort of nice. Okay, if you like my videos or you want my chess center to succeed, which I do, go to www.atlchessclub.com and consider a donation. Have a look around the website. Probably within the next two or three weeks, we're going to get an actual physical site, and then uh, we'll have a nice address for you. Uh, like and subscribe to the YouTube page here. We have over 900 subscribers, which is 800 more than I had last week. So you guys are doing a good job of subscribing. Uh, and go to my Facebook page, Ben Feingold, or Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. And go to Twitter and follow me at Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Occasionally I post funny stuff, not too funny. And don't forget, donate, donate, donate. The more you give, the more you learn. Okay, bye everybody, and I hope that you enjoyed uh, this Jackie Chan version of the video. And Jackie Chan may have been pretty aggressive and even funny at some times, but not as aggressive as Queen H8 check. Bye everyone.